Okay, hello everybody and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Gabby and I am joined here with Marilyn Takahishi Fordney, aka Winky, who spent time at Boys Town as a child after being rescued from the Japanese internment camps during World War II. Today, Winky is the director and assistant director of two nonprofit foundations, as well as a recently retired textbook author in the medicine and medical assisting disciplines. Hi, Winky. How are you doing today? Hi, I'm glad to um, be here for everybody because I also invited family and friends, and I'm glad to see everybody watching. Awesome. We are too. So with May being Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, we are so honored to have you join us to talk more about your life and specifically your time at Boys Town. For everyone watching this video, please make sure you give it a thumbs up. And if you're joining us live and have any questions for Winky as we go through this live stream, please feel free to leave them in the comment section below. Okay, so we are going to start off with learning a little bit more about your childhood. So if you would tell us, Winky, where were you born? I would, was born actually in South Central Los Angeles uh, in the mid-1930s. So um, this was right uh, after the Depres Depression era, so not as many babies were born at that time. And tell us, what was your childhood like prior to being sent to the Japanese internment camps? Uh, we lived at 37th and Halldale in Los Angeles, and this was um, uh, a piece of property that was on a corner, but the corner was a lot that was, was zoned business, and the a house we rented, and my father developed a rare plant nursery on that lot, and so that was going to be uh, something that he was that he had as a business and the name Takahashi means hybrid so the name of the nursery was hybrid nursery uh, the children that I grew up with were uh, the black and the brown kids Mexican and uh, uh, African-American uh, children uh, those were my playmates uh, every day and then I went to a uh, Japanese uh, school called uh, Mary Knoll um, in East Los Angeles every day and at that school they did have one of our classes as learning the language so i was still trying to retain my culture at that time very cool can you describe a little bit what was your home like describe your family and the house that you lived in uh, my mother was half irish my father was um, born here in america but he was full japanese um, my one grandmother had our had already passed away. She was the Irish one. Her name ended in O'Brien. Mm. And um, she met my grandfather here in America and they got married and began their family. So I have aunts and uncles that were born of that era. Um, my grandmother and grandfather both passed away before I was born. So I never got a chance to meet them. And biracial uh, children, uh, or marriages at that time were frowned upon in the Japanese uh, culture. They did not really accept that. Wow. So that was so, my entrance into the world. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you remember about being in the Japanese internment camps? How old were you when your family was moved there? Uh, I was about six years old. Um, it was not a pleasant experience for me. So from the very beginning, uh, actually, I was bullied because it, that's what you would call it now. At that time, they didn't have a real name for it. But um, I was bullied. And I have a feeling that it might have been because we, you know, we were mixed kids. We were from this odd family. Yeah. And um, they, they looked at us like that. Even though I look real Asian, um, for some reason, I was bullied. And I, I don't, as a child, really know why. Uh, only that that's what happened. And we lived in a, um, a one-room tar-papered barrack. Uh, it was black. And all of the places looked the same so that you, it would be difficult for a child to know which house they belonged to or which group of houses because they were all like, stuck together, so to speak. Um, so my mother uh, 
made a uh, paper drawing of a duck or a bird and she pasted it in the window and so that we knew then which one we belonged to so that's you know and then we had a mess hall so that all meals were served in this mess hall so everybody had to go there uh, every morning uh, for their breakfast and for lunch and for dinner and the breakfasts were always oatmeal mush and i remember very distinctly sitting at a table there and all of a sudden there was a big riot and they threw everybody out and the reason why is because uh, most Japanese families, many of the older generation, ate um, rice with um, uh, pickles and fish. You know, it wasn't like a typical American type breakfast. Mm -hmm. So they got tired of it and they decided they would make a big fuss. I guess maybe they thought maybe they could get something different, but uh, it ended up where everybody got thrown out. And as a child, you remember something like that. So that was very strong in my memory. <laughs> So how long were you at the internment camps? And with that, how did your family get connected with Father Flanagan and Boys Town during this time? Uh, my mother always admired so much the Irish part of her you know, heritage. So she started, I guess, thinking uh, about this uh, because that was a big issue at that point because she was different. Mm -hmm. And uh, she looked more like a Jean Turney, the actress. She had more of a uh occidental look uh, to her you couldn't really tell that she was asian i mean i didn't feel that she looked asian to me yeah. uh she had brown hair she her features were you know she had the high cheekbones and everything but she she looked more uh occidental to me mm -hmm. and um what happened was uh, she was emphasizing more the irish so i think she thought of father flanagan um she probably had seen some things about him and realized that he was a priest. We were Catholics. My father was a, a Catholic when he became married to my mother. So he was a person that was before that not really associated with any real true religion. He didn't go to church every Sunday or anything like that. But after the marriage, they emphasized more Catholicism. So uh, she had heard about Father Flanagan. So they decided to draft up a letter and they wrote this letter and my dad signed it and it, off it went. When Father Flanagan received the letter, he appealed to the government to see if there was some way he could get us uh, over to his place. And then he would hire my father to help take care of the grounds. And he got permission. So we were released after about four months. So we didn't have to be there a, a real long time. That became a, the Santa Anita racetrack is where we were. And that Santa Anita racetrack eventually was kind of like a distribution center so that families were sent there. And then from there, they were distributed to different camps uh, in the United States. So we, we didn't get distributed. In other words, we got out before the distribution occurred. Uh, we. My mother took, um, by that time we had three children. We had a baby. My brother was just an infant. He was just born at that time. Um, my sister Leona, which we call Tony, uh, she was my little sister, and then myself. So my mother took us on a train, which took actually two days to get to Boys Town. And my father was going to drive a truck full of maybe a refrigerator, some beds, you know, just bare necessities that we could use. Uh, when we got to Boys Town, it was at night, and it was in Omaha at the train depot, and um, Father Flanagan came to meet us there, and I remember, I'll for, never forget this, he came with a big brown paper bag full of candy, oh. so you know, for a child, you could never forget that, yeah. and that was very meaningful, and I can remember him taking us to a hotel there and going into this, I mean, to, to a child, that's a big adventure you know we, yes. that was fun uh, even being on the train to me was fun uh so uh then we got into this uh hotel and then he found this old farmhouse on the very edge of boys town and he uh, had us taken there and we we were there only a very short time when my father finally arrived uh my father in the meantime was driving and he stopped uh, for some gas and some food. And where he was going into this place for food, and uh, someone asked him, they said, uh, oh, are you Japanese? 
And he said, no, I'm Chinese. <laughs> he got out of there quickly and he got back in his truck and he decided at that point that he wouldn't stop uh, to stay anywhere because it meant that maybe he would get attacked. You know, maybe somebody would harm him and then he would never make it back to us. So uh, he decided to drive day and night, stopping only for fuel and getting uh, some sustenance that he could eat while he was driving. Uh, it took him three days to get to us. And when he got there, he was so tired because he hadn't slept. And um, they pulled out some mattresses from this truck. And I remember very distinctly in the farmhouse, they're pull, dragging in the mattress and he fell on the mattress and he just literally went to sleep. Yeah. Okay. So, so that was kind of a, a real, you know, um, that was our beginning, in other words, in this farmhouse. I can imagine that would be quite the journey for your father. So I'm, I'm thankful that for you that he was able to get there safely. Yes. <laughs> so you talked a little bit about your first time seeing Father Flanagan. Tell us, what was your first impression of Boys Town once you arrived? Oh, uh, as a child, you get, you know, it, well, you, you, it's an adventure. So you, whenever you see everything, it's uh, fun. You know, uh, it was a good experience. We met new people. Uh, we were the first family that he rescued from the camp. And, uh, you know, so we were met by many people and they were, you know, we were different. Uh, most of the people there were German farmers, um, so that when we would meet people, uh, they weren't Japanese. They, they were all, you know, Occidental type people. And uh, we had many uh, good memories there. Um, the father was very friendly. Uh, you know, he was somebody that was more like a friend than, you know, like say the director, we saw him more like somebody who was very friendly for us mm -hmm. because he met us at the depot, you know, he was, um, so it wasn't like somebody in authority. It was somebody who was like a friend. So we felt relaxed around him and everything that we did there was a very good experience. That's good. Describe you want some the memories and yes. you want me that yeah. was going to be okay. my next question. I wanted to know what are some of your most treasured memories during your time with us? Um, the most frequent treasured memories were when he would, uh, we would go to mass on Sunday and we would be sitting in the pews and then he would do the asparagus every time when he walked down before mass started. And as he did that, he would glance over at the people that he was seeing and whenever he saw my mother he'd say ah oh, mark kind of pick her out and that always impressed me because he recognized her and he that was like somebody special uh so that was one of the main memories the other memories were when we had a little school there it was a um a nun was assigned a franciscan nun by the name of sister mary agnes and um it was in one of the brick buildings there that is now a his, historical museum for Boys Town. Uh, that was one of the first buildings at Boys Town. And uh, this Franciscan was from a Polish background. So she would teach us the Polish May dances, uh, the um, tatting, how to do tatting, you know, things like that uh, when we would have breaks. And um, she also had a Christmas play and a May Day play. So Father Flanagan would come to visit on those days and we'd take a picture, a group picture with him. And so that was a, a very important memory for us because we'd look forward to his visit. Um, some of the other important things would be that he married my aunt and uncle, my uncle Ray, who is my mom's youngest brother, and my aunt Barbara. And they were married by Father Flanagan. Uh, and probably that was one of the as I recall, only the first time he married somebody there. I don't know if he married other people, but that's the only one I know of that he ever married. And um, we that, that picture was sent to people uh, to advertise about this interview. And so that shows my aunt and uncle with uh, us as a family there to, all together. Yeah, so... For those of you tuning in, if you saw the cover photo on the Facebook event, that is the photo 
that Winky is referring to, and I will make sure to put it in the comments section too after this live stream so you can see it and, and compare. But I'm so glad we have that photo. It's so it's probably such a special memory for you. So Yes, it is. Yes. <laughs> so talk a little bit more about the home that you stayed in on the Boys Town campus. You mentioned that it was one of our farm homes. Can you describe what it was like for you? Um, well, I'll first start at the farmhouse because the farmhouse was not just us. Uh, we were there first, okay, and it didn't have um, water that we could use. The water was rusty. The pipes were rusty, so we couldn't really bathe in the water. We couldn't drink the water. So we had a well. Uh, we had two different wells. One was a rainwater well and one was a drinking water well. And that was outside, and the boys that would hike like from Boys Town to go somewhere, they would stop at the farmhouse and get a drink of water. So there was always a cup there for them. Um, and then if we wanted to bathe, we would have to go and pump the water into a, a metal tub and then bring it in to the farmhouse, put it on this corn cob stove and start the <laughs> and heat up the water in order to have hot water to take a bath. So that's how the water system worked there. After a period of time, and I don't know the exact time, but maybe it could have been, uh, you know, three or four months, um, my Aunt Cherry was gotten from the uh, internment camp with her baby uh, son, her first child, and they lived in a back house that was attached to the farmhouse. And then in our house, another family came uh, that had a little girl. Uh, and she, they came from the internment camp also, and they lived with us there in the house. So we actually had three families living, uh, in the, two in our house, in the farmhouse, and one in the back house. And then after a period of time, it could have been maybe a year later or so, um, Father Flanagan built brick houses in the form of a sit, the way a six looks. And these brick houses were reserved for all the different families where, that worked there. So there were, was a mixture of um, the American Caucasian families and the ones that were from the internment camps. Uh, quite a few different families came. And those are the, then became more the children that were in our school. In other words, all the families that were there that had school age kids were then brought to the school. But there were many families that were, or some, not many, but there were some families that had small children, babies, or young kids that were like one and two years old. So they didn't come to the school. They were there. I saw them in, you know, in the community there. But uh, we didn't really socialize much with them because they weren't our chums at school, you know, and they were Japanese families, and when you're from a biracial, like mixed marriage type family, um, your bringing up is totally different than. We're different because we didn't eat all typical Japanese foods. We we were eating spaghetti, you know, hot dogs. I mean, you know, things like that. Uh, and Japanese families were different. Mm -hmm. So our mixture there was such that we knew them, we would say hello, but we, but we didn't have that many, what you would call the community meetings where people, because somebody asked me that and I said, no, we didn't really meet with them. We'd see them, we'd say hi. And we started raising our own vegetables. We had a vegetable garden and we would raise so many that uh, I had a little wagon and we'd put all the vegetables into the wagon and uh, every time they got ripe, I would go around this big six and I would knock on the door and offer these free to these people, you know, everybody there. So I, that way I did get to know them. Yeah. Uh, they would give me a coin. Sometimes they'd give me a, a nickel or a dime or something, you know, and I had a piggy bank. So I put it in that. Um, and we all had basements. Now in California, we didn't live with a basement. So that was a new experience to be able to have a, basement now that we had a, a garden with fruit and vegetables and all mostly all vegetables no fruit really but uh, vegetables um, my mother learned to can and we would put everything in the cold basement uh, we learned how to live there 
because it was freezing cold winters. So my father built a uh, greenhouse that was submerged in the earth next to this brick house. And because it was submerged, it kept everything warm. Plus he had a little stove in there so that it would keep um, the things that could not withstand the cold uh, during that time. He would move everything into this greenhouse. Uh, one year, the greenhouse caught fire and it burned down inside the earth. I mean, yeah, it was not, it, it, that was another thing that, you know, a child remembers because yeah, of that. Big event, um, right. Yeah. And then the other thing I remember very clearly is we were living in adjoining to the um, places where they milk the cows. They had other vegetable gardens there where they raised potato fields. Yeah. And if there was a freeze com coming, we were all alerted and all the families would run out. I mean, I'm talking about night. It's total darkness. And there we are digging in the ground for the potatoes to rescue them yeah. from the freeze. Yeah. So that was another experience that we would never have in California that was you know, quite unusual for us. But, you know, we were all hard workers. So we would be out there, you know, trying to save um, the food. And so that was another strong remembrance uh, of living in that brick house. Um, there was another thing that happened in the brick house that is not so nice. Uh, when my brother got to be three years old, he was at the breakfast table and he keeled over. And uh, he, we called the infirmary there at Boys Town and the, the nun came very quickly, who's the supervisor. And she pulled him up by the feet and shook him to let any saliva go out of his mouth. Yeah. And they rushed him over to the hospital in Omaha. He was in a coma for two months. Oh. Uh, at that time, the polio epidemic was very, um, a parent, so they thought maybe he had polio, so they put him into a um, contagion award type thing. And um, my mother stayed with him day and night, so she slept in the room. He was in this coma for two months, but his temperature got up so high that they had to put him in an ice bath. Mm -hmm. When he came out of that, it was um, measles encephalitis is what mm -hmm. he had. And he lost his brain function and was a two-month-old child then. Yeah. And that became his way the entire rest of his life. Uh, he passed away in early 50, like 90, when he was at 50 years old. So he remained at home. But the care for him then in the little brick house that we had became that we we act, I felt that we were actually then a prison. We, we couldn't leave. In other words, you always had to have somebody there watching him because you know he he didn't know what himself or he could get into trouble because he was a like a two-month-old he had to be fed he had to be bathed he had to be taken to the bathroom i mean just every and that was 24 7 and that my mother then became his nurse for the rest of his life so that was the, the unpleasant thing that we suffered uh in boys town that was you know something that you would never forget the rest of your life and being the oldest i experienced it there were others born after me so they wouldn't have seen him when he was normal i knew him as a normal little boy uh, when i went to school i had to walk a mile to school uh in, from the farmhouse and he would go to meet me he would run up to meet me after school uh because I carried a lunchbox and I would always save a treat for him. So I remember him running up, you know, greeting me after school to yeah. get his treat. He's like, the big back. sister's home. Life is good. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I'm sorry to hear about his passing, but I really appreciate you sharing that story with us. So talk a little bit more about mm -hmm. what it was like to attend school. You said you walked a mile every day. I can't imagine in the Nebraska winters, that was very fun, but talk a little bit more about what the actual school was like and maybe more about some of your school chums that you talked about that you would hang out with at school. Uh, this was uh, just, to, just to get to the school in winter, you wore galoshes and a complete attire from head to toe completely, you know, and my mother would walk me out to the main highway and then I would walk from there so alone. Mm -hmm. And so it was um, kind of a very alone feeling. 
uh, because at that point I was, I didn't have anyone going with me. I was by myself. Uh, I would get to the school and it's eight grades in the one room with a big stove that you put corn cobs in to heat, you know, wood and corn cobs in. Um, and the teach, we had one teacher and she would teach all of the eight grades. Um, so there weren't many students in my, in my age level. Um, but there were others that were all different age levels. Um, I didn't really have what I would call friends uh, from that school. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know why that was. I don't know why that, you know, but I was there not a real long time, but a brief time. But I do remember two stu students there that were not so nice. These were twin boys and they were very impish. And doing nasty things and of course as a child you believe everything you hear oh, yeah. and they they lived on a in a farm that was on the way to the school so i had to pass by it to get home mm -hmm. and they would tell me i'm letting out my bull to get you when you're walking you know and so i would run past i would try to get home as fast as i could yeah. i mean this very scary thing for me but this was something that happened on and off and i don't know why they did i think they were just like playing jokes and i thought it was serious i mean i was very you know scared you're like the bull's but, gonna get me yeah. i can't <laughs> <laughs> I gotta run right and it, it's called district it was called like I went to one school that was District 42, and then I went to another school that was District 60. That's the number. That's the name of the school is that's what they called it. Uh, interesting. So <laughs> you mentioned that you, you know, didn't get to know a lot within the school. But as Boys Town as a whole, did you get to know many of the Boys Town youth during this time? And if so, what were they like? Uh, well, then they started a school, which was in the little brick building, which Sister Agnes taught us. And all the children came from these different families. And there was only one little boy there that was uh, Asian, actually, from probably one of the camps. I didn't know him before, so he was a new person for me. Um, but the other children were all Caucasian. Now, the children that were Caucasian lived in this six. But the little Japanese boy lived in a house that was like on the way to the sick. So you'd have to walk by the house. Um, the children I made friends with were in the six. Mm -hmm. And because they were all Caucasian kids, we experienced different things. Not, not our, my culture was no longer being retained. Uh, I didn't have a way to speak to these kids or, you know, I mean, it was just, it wasn't like being in the internment camp. Right. It, it was totally different. So the the children that I made friends with, we became good friends. And um, to this day, I still retain friendship to two of the children that are still alive. Um, Ron Witkowski is the son of one of the first boys at Boys Town. And he lived in the six and we still correspond through email and mm -hmm. he got married and I still correspond at Christmas. We exchange uh, cards and letters and notes. Um, also, Kathy Amelia became a sister of the same order, a Franciscan order of the sister that taught us. Uh, she is in uh, Illinois and she still uh, corresponds with me by email. Uh, we visited once or so or twice, actually, when she when I went to Chicago and when she came out to uh, California. So we still retain that friendship after all these many, many years, which yeah. to me is like a treasure because those are the gems in your life that yeah. you can make friends that long. Um, so those are the ones that I made friends with. And uh, I think that going back and forth, uh, there were different things that happened because we would walk back and forth to the school. Um, we learned, um, you know, different things like Polish dances and they dressed as they, I don't even know how my mother made the costumes, but we made, they were, we were in Polish co dress costumes, all the, all the children when we did the dances. So obviously there was some communication between, mm. uh, you know, the families with the, the, the teacher. Uh, but those are things that I don't know. I never quit. I, I really didn't, I really didn't ask my mother about too much because right. when she had, you know, when she was taking care of my brother, uh, we kind of did our own thing. You know, we knew she was busy. Uh, 
I, I don't even remember going to her even with problems. Yeah. We, we all solved our own problems. You know, as children growing up, you kind of do that. Mm-hmm. Your parents are, are stuck, you know, they're right. in a situation and you're going to try and, as the oldest, I was trying to keep, try to behave. In other words, right. not being nasty, I was trying to behave. And I think that that's why the, um, some things I don't know. And I didn't, I don't know why, but I was always busy. I never asked her about mm-hmm. the things even after. Very cool. Well, did Father Flanagan ever come and watch any of your Polish dances? Uh, yeah, he came to watch that. And um, he also, uh, it was like he was a friend. Sometime he'd come and visit us at the Brick House. One day he came to visit, and this is a funny story because um, my sister was, you know, very, like she'd climb things. She'd climb over, a, okay. you know, a, a railing or whatever. Anyway, my dad uh, would, uh, part of his job was sorting things out. Things were donated to the to Boys Town, and he had to sort things out and take anything to the trash that, that wasn't workable. You know, in other words, say something was donated and it really didn't suit boys. You know, so one day he was um, sorting and he found a pair of shoes, and the shoes were too small for the boys there because at that point they didn't have young kids. Yeah. They had more teens and above. You know, they were mm-hmm. older kids. But somebody had donated these little shoes, and so he brought them to the house, and they were black leather. I recall them very distinctly the way they looked. Uh, and he, he liked shoes. He had known he knew how to make shoes. My father's dad was a shoemaker, so he knew how to make shoes. He taught my dad, and my dad knew how to make shoes. So he looked at these shoes, and my God, these shoes were so well made. He thought, this is great. The, Tony's going to wear these. Yeah. So he brought home and my sister wouldn't put them on because she she didn't like the way they looked because they were kind of boyish looking you know so anyways that particular day father flanagan came by and that was when my dad was trying to get her to put those shoes on and he went over and he said dear and he's trying to call her to get and he thought he could do anything with the boys so he could easily he thought easily he could do something with the girls you know <laughs> well that, that didn't work at all she he never got her to put her shoes on uh, no <laughs> she was very even, stubborn he couldn't bribe her with a bag of candy like he did no, with you i think maybe he could have with a bag of candy but he <laughs> didn't no. have it. no no <laughs> oh my gosh that is so funny do you have any other funny stories with father flanagan or specific memories oh, because i love that you said how he was more like a friend than a director i think that's really meaningful for a lot of people watching just to learn more about what he was like from someone who knew him well yeah the only other one i have is when uh when we go into a discussion about why we left boys town Okay. Yeah. yeah. So we can, yeah, loop that into because it is the next question on our list. So why? Oh, well, I forgot about one thing. Yeah. Uh, we did as as Boys Town started to progress in years, yeah. they decided to start to admit some younger boys in, okay. and I'm talking about like more like 12 years old, 13 and 14, that age mm-hmm. group, because um, before that they didn't. The older. Um, they didn't have education for the older ones, and so they decided, I mean, the younger ones, so they decided to only have older ones at that point. But when we came and they had the little school, they thought, well, we'll start to bring in some younger kids. Mm-hmm. So they brought in Boudreaux and Sharkey. Now, boys at Boys Town were normally called by their last names. So I don't know why the name Boudreaux, maybe it's a last name, and mm-hmm. Sharkey is, you know, I, I don't know. But... Um, <laughs> Those two boys were brought in. Of course, they, they were the odd ones because they didn't have parents. They were coming from, you know, a different background. Yeah. Um, maybe they did have parents, but maybe the parents were, maybe it was only one parent. I, I really don't know because I never even asked them. But that became a big event in the school when they were admitted because we can we, we would look over it because to us they were different. You know, they were coming from a different background. Um, and and we had a lot of interaction with them because they would, they were like uh, pranksters. They wanted yeah. to make jokes and, and do a lot of laughing. And so they had a good schooling there. And also it was like a breakthrough to bring in younger people, which I thought was a good thing. Yeah, that's great. And I'm sure that was a lot of fun for you too, to be around 
boys maybe closer to your age? Because how old were you when you left Boys Town? Because you would have been uh, I was, seven. Yeah, I was uh, actually, no, I was six when I got there and it was five years later. So I was okay. 11 going on 12. Yeah. yeah. So you were still pretty young. Yeah. 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 So why did your family leave Boys Town? Because I know you returned to California. Is that correct? Right. Um, what happened is there was a university graduate that was hired by Father Flanagan to take care of the grounds. Mm -hmm. And my father had been originally taking care of the grounds the five years and had 20 boys under his supervision. And my father is a leader type. So he was very good with this. Yeah. You know, the boys got to know him really well. They, the, in fact, those boys became more like friends and, and life to, uh, lifelong friends. Um, they, they really loved our family. They saw, saw us as a unit. We became like a little figurehead for them. Um, they would come visit us at the house. Uh, so it wasn't just work. It was also even a friend type. And even after we left Boys Town, we connected still with some. So it, it was a little a different situation. And when that happened, my father felt real not he was upset about it uh, my mother and dad were both upset that they thought oh wow somebody putting telling my dad what to do when my dad had been there five years and knew exactly what plants would be in good in certain places and and you know the weather i mean just everything about the plants and how you you know help them survive yeah. in, a, in a situation like that so uh, he, he thought about it and then he thought, well, maybe it's meant to be the we're getting older. Uh, the you know, in other words, they were the older people were getting older, you know, and they were thinking, how are we going to survive these winters when we get to be old people? Uh, it's you know, it's not as easy. Uh, you get, you know, that that, you know, it's way below zero. And I mean, it's it wasn't that pleasant. And we, they were already used to California weather. So you really get spoiled. Once you've had California weather, it's hard to live somewhere else. Yeah. So, you know, and because we had been in the camp, at least that was a way of getting out. That So that was fine. But when it came to actually trying to um, think about the future, it wasn't always the best thought. So they thought, well, maybe we should start to think about you know, moving back to California. So they decided to, my dad would scout someplace available. And then with my grandmother's help, she was a saver of money. He would try and pile the money together to get a down payment so that we could then have a place to move back to. So that's exactly what happened. Uh, they made a decision to um, decide to move. And this was a big decision. Um, because it wasn't going to be an easy thing. So he, he bought a truck that was a one and a half ton trailer and he put a canvas over the back of it that was made to look more like a covered wagon actually. Uh, the canvas stretched across metal bars that he had made up and uh, then we he constructed a window um, so that we could look out and they put in the furniture and whatever beds that a refrigerator things that we needed just the bare necessities to drive back to california and we were put on a feather bed in the top my sis my the three girls by that time we'd had myself my sister uh, that was next to me tony and then we had mava who was a smaller uh she was born at boys town so mm -hmm. uh, we had three girls and but then my brother was being that he's ill he would be the one that sat in my in the cab with my parents so that's how we made it back to California. And when we got back, uh, oh, and before we got back, uh, we drove over to Father Flanagan. And this is very distinct in our memory is that um, uh, he blessed us and he blessed the truck. And on the way back, it took us eight days to get back to California because we stopped along the way yeah. and we would see lights. You know, we weren't just going to drive straight through, but we had to stop through. We'd stay overnight in a place so that we could cook our meals and save that way because we didn't have a lot of money to spend. And um, he got to New Mexico. And by that time, we were in the painted desert that we had been going up and down these, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what you call them. They're small hills. Mm -hmm. uh, all day long and we got to this place to stay and the next morning he walked out and he decided to walk around that truck and he walked around he was looking at the wheels and when he got to one of the wheels it was being held on by one bolt 
<laughs> and we bought a big bought a, a one and a half ton trailer. You know, I mean, this was it. We could have been killed. In other words, if he had got, continued on and had not seen that, uh, that trailer could have been in a terrible accident. We could have all been killed. We thought back about Father Flanagan blessing our, you know, truck and blessing us as well. And um, we feel that that blessing was something that saved us. And so he got it fixed and then we continued on our journey. And when we got back to California, uh, we lived in South Central Los Angeles and uh, we lived three families in a house that had one bathroom and one kitchen. So it was real difficult. Uh, we had to, that was the only way to save money because we were, you know, and really all the families were really in hard. We had lost everything, really. It was not an easy way back. Yeah. Um, so we were there about three years. We saved enough to, for a down payment and we moved into a house that needed fixing. And um, friends came to help, relatives, everybody pitched in to help. Uh, the same way that we did to make it back with the three families, everyone pitched in. We tried to do our best uh, to live that way, which was to me, holy hell. I didn't like it at all. It was really yeah. awful. Um, but we made it back and uh, we had a parish there, Holy Names, uh, Holy Name was our parish. And my dad would go over there and cut their lawn and trim their, prune their trees and all. And they paid for my high school education. My, uh, I went to a private school, a girl's school, and um, they paid for my high school education. And that's how we made it back. When I graduated from that uh, high school, I then uh, went directly into a, a medical office to work as a medical assistant who was actually, my godfather was the one who was in that office and his son was an orthopedic surgeon. And so uh, I was then um, working for the son. And uh, I went to school at night, uh, driving, I mean, riding on a bus at night to Hollywood High School, which is now Hollywood Adult School for five years after work wow. <laughs> so that I, that I could get some certificates to learn uh, what I needed for the, the job. And at that job, I learned, uh, you know, all the medical terminology and everything. Uh, eventually, I went to work for UCLA in medical research uh, for a biophysics professor. And from there, went to a uh, office on UCLA campus for a doctor, Dr. James B. Peter, MD, uh, who was uh, the brother of Dr. Val. Of, doc, of Father Val Peter, who ended up as the uh, director of Boys Town. So it was kind of like I was led on this path mm. uh, through these various journeys. Mm. And um, while I was at Boys Town, the, uh, my uh, terminology teacher at Hollywood High Adult School said, she called me up and she said, how would you like to teach? I said, well, I don't have a degree. I just you know, have certificates you know, from yeah. the school. And so she said, no, you don't need anything. You come over to the school and you'll see if you like it or not. <laughs> so I quit my job at UCLA and went over there to teach. And I liked it. I really enjoyed teaching. So I went on weekends to get uh, credentials at UCLA. I got three credentials to teach uh, using your experience uh, on the job. And I ended up teaching in community colleges and adult eds uh, and really enjoyed all of that. Yeah. One of the schools bought a printing press, so I thought, well, I'll put together some syllabi. I put together four syllabi. A teacher I know that's down in San Diego came to visit, and she said, I'm not leaving your house until you promise to send these syllabi to these publishers. I said, oh, you've got to be kidding. I don't know how to write. She, you know, so she said, no, I'm not leaving. She was very stubborn. So I said, okay, uh, I'll send. Who do you? Who should I send? So she gave me the names of three publishers. So I sent off these syllabi to this, these three publishers. And before I was ready to leave for a two week holiday, a publisher in New York called me and asked me for it. I thought, oh, okay, I'll send it. Yeah. So after the two weeks we came home, all of them wanted the book. Wow. All, I thought, oh my God. So I had to go to, <laughs> had to go over to a bookstore and see who did the best marketing and, and publishing, you know, the best job on the book. The, the, right. the marketing of it. So I eventually signed with um, W.B. Saunders in Philadelphia. And uh, I got a, an attorney who was a friend of ours for Capitol Records to help me. And so we he showed me the ropes of negotiation. And um, 
that was my first book to write in 1975. And 40 years later, there I am now, <laughs> just retired from publishing. Uh, the books are still being carried on. One is going to a 16th edition. Yeah. Uh, that book won four national awards and uh, helped establish uh, two nonprofit foundations for kids. And that's what we do now. We run these two nonprofit foundations. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about your foundations. Uh, the foundations, the first one I started, uh, my husband died. And my first husband, actually, I didn't even tell you about what happened there. I was only married uh, for, you know, barely a month. And uh, our house burned completely to the ground. So I was going to start all over again. And by that time, uh, you know, I, had, I was really, uh, I, I just didn't know what to do. I uh, Actually, after the fire, I couldn't even feel my skin. I tried to touch myself. And uh, everyone experiences in a different way, you know, but... Um, I knew we would make it back. I said, we're going to make it back. I said, I did this once before. We'll make it back. Yeah. So we did make it back. We moved uh, to another location, uh, to a different county and everything. And that's where I ended up teaching uh, and going into writing the books and all. Um, then in the second marriage, uh, after um, my husband died in uh, 7797, I decided to, uh, I got a telemarketing call. And it was for a free dance lesson. And I love dancing. So I thought, you know, I would have been a dancer, actually, if I didn't, if I was, you know, able to. But financially, I couldn't work. So I had to work. But um, uh, it offered a free dance lesson. I thought, oh, I can't lose anything that way, you know. And uh, now that I'm all alone, this would be a good way to meet people and, and get out there, you know. Yeah. I, wasn't, I wasn't going out. I wasn't doing anything. So I took the dance lesson and actually between three and a half to four months later, I was in dancing and pro-am dance competitions. Uh, I started these pro-am dance competitions. It's like what you see on Dancing with the Stars. Yeah. You dance with a professional. And I did both American and international style dancing, a standard and smooth and rhythm and Latin in all four styles, um, which most people don't because that's kind of crazy. But it, and it, I did that and I loved it. And I thought, you know, there aren't enough kids dancing on, in the ballroom competition. And I, I, I went to my accountant and I said, uh, what do you think about my starting foundation? No, normally my CPA would nix everything I said. So I thought, well, um, he said, this, this is the best idea you came up with. I, he said, this is great. So I said, okay, can you help me? So he helped me set up the first foundation in 2004. Mm -hmm. And I started building it by putting the money into investments. So my, m the money I would pay in taxes would go to this foundation, much of it. And then that would build up through these investments and that then I could give out to all the kids. Mm -hmm. So I started that and actually it's become a godsend. The kids at the time when I was dancing then were not so great. They were not what I would call top level dancers. Uh, today, when you walk in uh, to see a dance competition, they are like little professionals coming out. They are absolutely incredible. They even now go to Europe to compete and get first and second prizes, which is very, very unique, That's you know, to do that. Um, the kids in my dream program uh, in elementary schools, we give a 15-week um, da professional dancer teacher that goes in there. Erica Arnold is our dance teacher, and she and her husband both run a, found, a, a dance school now, and they go right in to teach the 15 weeks. Then we do a showcase so all parents can watch everything that happens, what they've learned, everything. We give out medals to each child so that they know that they've accomplished something. So to them, it's a big thing for them, and they've learned something, which is a skill. They've learned etiquette. They've learned many things, good health. Um, yeah. all good habits, getting them away from the computer, just all these wonderful things that they need in their life that they're not getting. And so the families are very uh, thankful because they know dance lessons are expensive yeah. and they don't have the time to take the kids and all of this. So it's done right during class. It's in many times it takes over from their gymnasium or, you know, their, um, their um, more like sport classes so that they can still get credit for it. So they get credit for it uh, on, on their campus. Uh, 
and I met my husband. This is amazing. I met, I figured seven years later, if I was going to remarry, I would remarry seven years. I met him seven years later while I was practicing at a, um, a, a what we call the Oxnard City uh, Community Center. It was a community center dance. And I thought, you know, I didn't get enough practice in this week. I'm going to go over there and practice. So I went over there one night to practice. And that was the night he came. Wow. And it turned out that uh, uh, he was sitting alone. And I walked over there and sat down and started to chat with him. And he could hardly speak English. And the next night, he took me out to a dance at Alpine Village. And I thought, he was a good dancer. He yeah. loved to dance, and what was really interesting is that he loved to sing, mm -hmm. and when the music would come on that he had songs that he knew the words, he would sing these songs. They were like in Polish or German. I mean, he spoke six languages, so, you know, he would mm -hmm. sing all. Yeah, so he was like, oh, how romantic. <laughs> yeah. You're like, I don't so. know what he's saying, but it sounds nice. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, he, and he got to see me in dance competition and everything, so he knew what I was doing. And we got married, and uh, then uh, he wanted to go to contract school. So we, he became a general contractor here in California because he was, he was a civil engineer, um, and he ran a big business back in Hungary, so he's from Hungary. And uh, then in 2006, um, there was a, a big recession and I thought, you know, I think we should start a foundation. Let's just close this business. This isn't going to do any good. So we closed the business. We started the second foundation, the Havashi Wilderness Foundation. And that foundation, it was the best decision we ever made. I'll tell you. Um, one of Alex's um, uh, real passions is photography. Yeah. And he had some just regular you know, pick up and shoot type cameras. And I thought, you know, if we run a foundation, let's get a good camera. Let's take, uh, let's start on wildlife. And we both love animals. And being that the old farmhouse was next to a forest and I played in the forest as a child, I loved animals and I've always had a pet dog, always. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I thought let's start one for animals, plants, ecology, all of the things that needed to save our planet. Yeah. So. The Havashi Wilderness Foundation got started in 2007. And being that, you know, we wanted to, you know, educate children, we connected with the Resource Conservation District of the Santa Monica Mountains. And they schedule all of our field trips for all of the elementary schools. And we, we reach out now to about 2,000 kids every school year because that's what we want to educate. And, and then we visit the schools. And we do an interactive session with them, and also for these kids as, uh, you know, children that have actually participated in a scientific type education. So that the medal itself does state that. And they get to take that home for family, friends, and relatives so that they can show what they've wow. learned and why they learned it and how much they've learned. They can even go to one of the, where they went on a field trip, to Topanga State Park or to the Malibu Lagoon, and they can show their parents, this is this, this is that, because they can explain to them what they're seeing because the people that take them on the field trips are trained educators that have been trained to that specific area. And they even use microscopes. They get specimens of the water from the Malibu, uh, from the ocean, and they actually look at it under the microscope. So they're not just walking around looking, yeah. they actually do Funny. things. Gosh, that's and of course, so cool. Yeah, we've traveled the world yeah. because we, you know, we have to take. So we, we put these on. My husband became very proficient with his photography, and he was able to do um, like a 15 to 20 minute segment type um, uh, files so that we go to community service organizations, we give lectures, uh, we answer questions, we show they can see everything and learn more. And uh, we've, we've traveled all over the world everywhere there's a, not too much left that we haven't visited but we traveled the whole world and we've taken photographs and we've posted these as virtual uh on our virtual field trip places so that the public can see some of those and experience it so that they can also see them when they want to too perfect yes i will make sure to link in the comment section of this video both of winky's foundation so you all watching can check them out and learn more about them 
So thank you so much for talking about them. It's so cool to see and or listen to how you went from, you know, being rescued to, from this Japanese internment camp to starting two nonprofits and being this renounced author. And, you know, you probably, when you're a little girl, never thought that you would accomplish this much. So it's just, it's so oh. awesome to hear. Well, I'll tell you one thing I would like to tell the audience that's watching, and that is that when you go through trials and tribulations in your life, that if you say that you can do it, mm -hmm. with a positive statement, and you keep that in your mind, you can become an overachiever and get to the positive parts always. It'll always help you. But if you keep thinking negative thoughts, then it'll just bring you down. So my feeling is that I always, when something comes along, I say, I can do it. I yes. can. And <laughs> I love that. We love your positivity. It's so, it's so inspiring. Are so, there any questions? Um, let's see. I think I just have one more. We, you do have some comments um, complimenting you. So, oh. <laughs> what an amazing woman you are. So. I, I definitely agree with that. <laughs> well, I thought if there were questions from them, you know, they could always ask me any because I know sometimes I can't always answer because sometimes I don't recall every little detail, yes. but yes. I try. Well, I'm amazed by how much you remember even being just, mm -hmm. you know, six years old to 11 at Boys Town. I feel like you remember so much stuff from it. So it's so cool. So I guess my last question is, how did you get reconnected with Boys Town in your adult life? Um, I got reconnected because the government, federal government, uh, after several years went by, there were people trying to petition to have them recognize that this was indeed uh, something that did happen because it wasn't even in the history books. It was never written about. And... Um, I think that the federal government decided that they wanted to give to the ones or recognition to the ones that were still alive. Mm -hmm. So they, they gave retribution money. And I decided that at that point I had established my career. I really didn't need the funds. My mother had already passed on, so she didn't really receive any and I couldn't give to her. So I thought maybe the best thing would be to give to those that were born after. So I gave, a portion of those funds to the two sisters that were born after the uh, that happened, and also I decided to use one portion to give to Boys Town and another portion. So I divided it into four. The last one I gave to start the foundation, the Fordney Foundation, that was started with the last five thousand. Yeah. So then in nineteen ninety seven, nine I think no not let's see no it was ninety six or 94, I think it was 1994. I'm not sure of the exact date, but we, um, my husband was still alive, my first husband. And uh, I connected then with Boys Town and I decided to give them $5,000 to a special type fund that gains dividends and that eventually then reverts the entire thing so that that stays with Boys Town to help other kids. Uh, I decided to go back to see everything because things had changed. Yeah. The year that I went back to visit Boys Town, Father Val Peter was the director who was the brother of the physician I had worked for. So it was kind of like it was meant to be yeah. that I meet the director. So, of course, he welcomed me like family <laughs> because I was connected with his brother, right. you know. And at that time, they had places for us to stay that was on the campus there. Um, I, they had a special name for that section of Boys Town. I don't know what they call it now, but at any rate, we stayed there. Uh, it was a wonderful experience because I got to go back to see uh, a lot of things that went, you know, that were changed. Yeah. And then we had a reunion also of all any kids that were still alive that were in the little school that we had there at Boys Town. So I got to meet the ones that were, you know, still there. And that, of course, and then even um, Sister Agnes, you know, in other words, every everybody came back together again. Uh, it was kind of a, a very meaningful experience. So we planned a lot of things around that. And I got to ride over to Millard to see Millard and the way it looks now and different things. Oh, and we went in to visit the um, uh, 
uh, well, we went to visit different places there. Like there's a school in uh, Omaha that's connected with Boys on Hospital that has a deaf, um, uh, they um, yeah. operate on the need uh, problems for hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we got to do a lot of that. And then I did give two lectures to the health career of students at Boys Town to try to motivate them so that would pick up their spirits so that they would have a lot of hope when they um, graduate and move on in their lives. And my husband, my first husband was in films. So he used his voice uh, in sports car racing and also like in Love Bug and Viva Las Vegas with Elvis Presley and all. Well, when the kids found out that, my God, the <laughs> It was uh, there was like a little riot that occurred in the room, but it was a fun visit to go back. Um, and you know, and I still feel very connected. And so, um, we are trying to work out something now because the education center there is going to be completely revamped yeah. from school, and uh, we're going to try and work something out with our Habashi Wilderness Foundation to uh, do something for major for Boys Town, which will be a major undertaking and a, a major contribution from us. Well, yes, when the education center maybe is built or even before then, you should definitely come back and visit us because even from the 90s, our campus has changed so much. So it'd be great to have you back for a visit. Well, I think my husband and I would love to, to come back because he's like an adventurer and it would be a real adventure for him to see that place and to see the Midwest because I don't, that's part of the United States that he's been all to many, many states, but that's one state I don't believe that he's ever really gotten to see. Yeah. And yeah, I think it would be an excellent idea. So I'm looking forward to that. Good. Yes. We'll definitely have to plan something. Yeah. Okay. So... Gosh, I think that's, that is the end of our question. So for everyone watching, thank you for joining us. Winky, it was so, so wonderful to hear more about you and your time at Boys Town. And we're really grateful to be connected with someone like you who has such a unique experience with Father Flanagan, with the earlier days of Boys Town. And we really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us. Well, I just have one little um, comment, and that is that there may be some people that don't know, but Father Flanagan is up for being um, given the title as a saint. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there are people that pray to him so that uh, miracles can be performed and so forth. Um, I think for us it was a miracle because uh, we would have ended up totally different than the way we ended up. And I feel that um, uh, he, he is he is a saint. Yes. yes. And thank you so much for inviting me to have the interview and thank the audience that it, was able to watch and that will future watch because we will have this recorded on, uh, on other areas to be able to watch it. Uh, thank you for everyone, you know, coming to watch today. Yes. Perfect. Well, we'll talk to you very soon, Winky. And thank you everyone for joining. Bye. Uh, bye. <laughs>